Hello Cardinals and welcome to our next installment of Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Crake. This is chapter three, Nooners. Noon's the worst with its glare and humidity. At about 11 o'clock, Snowman retreats back into the forest out of sight of the sea altogether because the evil rays bounce off the water and get at him even if he's protected from the sky. And then he reddens and blisters. What he could really use is a tube of heavy duty sunblock supposing he could ever find one. So once again, we've got this idea that the sun is even more deadly than it was before. I don't know how long you guys can stay outside before you redden and blister, um, but for him, with his fair skin and with this new sun, it's very, very quickly. So something happened with the sky. In the first week, when he'd had more energy, he'd made himself a lean-to using fallen branches and a roll of duct tape and a plastic tarp he'd found in the trunk of a smashed-up car. At that time, he had a knife, but he lost it a week later, or was it two weeks? So at least three weeks have passed just in this section, so how long has he been out there? How long has the world been over? He must keep better track of such things as weeks, the knife was one of those pocket items with two blades and all, a tiny saw, a nail file, and a corkscrew. Also, a little pair of scissors, which he'd used to cut his toenails, and the duct tape as well. He regrets the loss of the scissors. He was given a knife like that for his ninth birthday by his father. His father was always giving him tools, trying to make him more practical. In his father's opinion, Jimmy couldn't screw in a light bulb. So who wants to screw in a light bulb, says the voice in Snowman's head, a stand-up comic this time. I'd rather do it in bed. Shut up, says Snowman. You'll find that most of Snowman's, like, jokes have sexual innuendo in them. Most of his inner thoughts have sex of some sort. If you remember from earlier, there was that section where he was talking about not fraternizing with the natives. He's got sex on the brain. Did you give him a dollar? Oryx had asked him when he told her about the knife. No. Why? You need to give money when someone gives you a knife, so the bad luck won't cut you. I wouldn't like it for you to be cut by the bad luck, Jimmy. Who told you that? Oh, someone, said Oryx. Someone played a big part in her life. Someone who? Jimmy hated him, this someone, faceless, eyeless, mocking, all hands and dick, now singular, now double, now a multitude. But Oryx had her mouth next to his ear and was whispering, Oh, oh, someone, and laughing at the same time. So how could he concentrate on his stupid old hate? So there's a couple things here, this idea of superstition. You have to give money when someone gives you a knife, otherwise you'll be cut by the bad luck. Oryx is very superstitious. And when he asks where she heard it from, she says someone, and that um, makes Jimmy's jealousy just go crazy. He's jealous of all these people in her past that he has never met and never will meet. But it's almost this idea of ownership. They touched his girl, and so he has this idea of feeling angry about it. In the short period of the lean-to, he'd slept on a fold-up cot he'd dragged from a bungalow half a mile away, a metal frame with a foam mattress on top of a grillwork of springs. The first night, he'd been attacked by ants, so he'd filled four tin cans with water and stuck the cot legs into them. That put a stop to the ants. That's a trick you can also do if you feed uh, cats or dogs outside. If you put their bowl into a bowl of water, it stops ants. Just, you know, neat little thing. But the buildup of hot, damp air under the tarp was too uncomfortable. At night, at ground level with no breeze, the huma humidity felt like 100%. His breath fogged the plastic. Also, the recunks were a nuisance, scuffling through the leaves and sniffing at his toes, nosing around him if he was, um, as if he was already garbage. So now we have a new animal just kind of dropped in. I'm sure if you guys thought about it, you could figure out what this is a hybrid of. However, they don't seem dangerous because he just calls them a nuisance and they just sniff at his toes. They don't eat them. And one morning, he'd woken to find three pigoons gazing in at him through the plastic. One was a male. He thought he could see the gleaming point of a white tusk. Pigoons were supposed to be tusk-free, but maybe they were reverting to, um, sorry. But maybe they were reverting to type now that they'd gone feral. A fast-forward process considering their rapid maturity genes. 
He'd shouted at them and waved his arms, and they'd run off, but who could tell what they might do next time they came around? Uh, just a little hint to remember this idea of rapid maturity genes. It's definitely something that will come up again. Then are the Woolvogs. It wouldn't take them forever to figure out that he no longer had a spray gun. He'd thrown it away when he'd run out of virtual bullets for it. Dumb to have not swiped a recharger for it, a mistake like setting up his sleeping quarters at ground level. So also a new thing there, this concept of a spray gun with virtual bullets. But I bet you they don't virtually kill you. I think they probably literally kill you. I wonder what that means, virtual bullets. So he'd moved to the tree. No pagoons or woolvogs up there, and few reconks. They preferred the undergrowth. He'd constructed a rough platform in the main branches out of scrap wood and duct tape. It's not a bad job. He's always been handier at putting things together than his father gave him credit for. At first, he'd taken the foam mattress up there, but he'd had to toss it when it began to mildew and to smell tantalizingly of tomato soup. Ew. The plastic tarp on the lean-to was torn away during an unusually violent storm. The bed frame remains, however, he can still use it at noon. He's found that if he stretches out on it, flat on his back with his arms spread wide and his sheet off like a saint arranged ready for frying, it's better than lying on the ground. At least he can get some air on all the surfaces of his body. From nowhere, a word appears, Mesozoic. He can see the word, he can hear the word, but he can't reach the word, he can't attach it to anything. This is happening too much lately, this disillusion of meaning, the entries on his cherished word list dripping off into space. It's only the heat, he tells himself, I'll be fine once it rains. He's sweating so hard he can almost hear it, trickles of sweat crawl down him except that sometimes the trickles are insects. He appears to be attractive to beetles. Beetles, flies, bees, as if he's dead meat or one of the nastier flowers. The best thing about the noon hours is that at least he doesn't get hungry. So at least there's one good thing, right? Even the thought of food makes him queasy, like chocolate cake in a steam bath. He wishes he could cool himself out. Uh, he wishes he could cool himself by hanging out his tongue. So kind of like a dog, right? I don't know. I live in El Cajon where in the summers it can get about 105, 110 if it's feeling frisky. And you definitely don't eat then, right? It's just the weight of the food feels like too much. Now the sun is at full glare, the zenith, which is like the highest point, so noon. It used to be called. Snowman lies splayed out on the grillwork of the bed in the liquid shade, giving himself up to the heat. Let's pretend this is a vacation, a school teacher's voice this time, perky, condescending. Miss Stratton, call me Sally with the big butt. Let's pretend this, let's pretend that. They spent the first three years of school getting you to pretend stuff and then the rest of it marking you down if you did the same thing. I so agree with that. Um, I've tried to do projects with 11th graders where like you guys just have zero imagination because we spend so much time getting you to pretend and then twice as much time telling you not to. We almost beat the imagination out of you. Strange. Let's pretend I'm here with you, big butt and all, getting ready to suck your brains right out your... Is there a faint stirring? He looks down at himself, no action. Sally Stratton vanishes and just as well. He has to find more and better ways of occupying his time. So sexual thoughts are also no longer working for him. I don't know, maybe it's the apocalypse, maybe it's the heat, but he's just not feeling it. His time, what a bankrupt idea, as if he's been given a box of time belonging to him alone, stuffed to the brim with hours and minutes that he can spend like money. Trouble is the box has holes in it and the time's running out no matter what he does with it. He might whittle, for instance. I hope you guys remember that word from the road. Make a chess set, play games with himself. With himself. He used to play chess with Craig, but they'd played by computer, not with actual chessmen. Craig won mostly. There must be another knife somewhere. If he sets his mind to it, goes foraging, scrapes around in the leftovers, he'd be sure to find one. Now that he's thought of it, he's surprised he hasn't thought of it before. He lets himself drift back to those after-school times with Craig. It was harmless enough at first. They might play Extinctathon or one of the others, three-dimensional Waco, Barbarian Stomp, Quick Time Osama. 
They all use parallel strategies. You had to see where you were headed before you got there, but also where the other guy was headed. Craig was good at those games because he was the master of the sideways leap. Jimmy could sometimes win at quick time Osama, though, as long as Craig played the infidel side. So a note on the video games that Craig and J Jimmy used to play, Extinctathon, pretty obvious about extinction. Uh, Barbarian Stomp. Yeah, I get the idea of barbarians. These two, Osama bin Laden, um, so he mentions that he could win if Craig played the infidel side. So Osama bin Laden was the leader of Al-Qaeda um, and a terrorist basically responsible for uh, mass murder. Waco is referencing Waco, Texas, where David Koresh was a cult leader uh, called the Branch Davidians, I believe. Um, basically, the FBI went to stop him and he had barricaded himself inside. So I imagine for this one, they're like playing either the FBI side or the Branch Davidian side. That's my guess. But I want you to kind of think, what do all these video games have in common? Um, what does that say about Craig? That he is a master of the sideways leap. Hmm. No hope of whittling that kind of game, however, he's talking about these digital games. It would have to be chess. Or he could keep a diary, set down his impressions. There must be lots of paper lying around in the unburned interior spaces that are still leak-free and pens and pencils. He'd seen them on his scavenging forays, but he'd never bother taking any. He could emulate the captains of ships in olden times, the ship going down in a storm, the captain in his, cam in his cabin, doomed but intrepid, filling in the logbook. There were movies like that, or castaways on desert islands keeping their journals day by tedious day, lists of supplies, notations on the weather, small actions performed, the sewing of a button, the devouring of a clam. He too is a castaway of sorts. He could make lists, it could give his life some structure. But even a castaway assumes a future reader, someone who will come along later and find his bones in his ledger and learn his fate. Snowman can make no such assumptions. He'll have no future reader because the Quakers can't read. Any reader he can possibly imagine is in the past. Interesting. And yet here we are all reading this account, right? And also just as a side note, you got time, teach the Quakers to read. I don't know. A caterpillar is letting itself down on a thread, twirling slowly like a rope artist, spiraling towards his chest. It's a luscious, unreal green like a gumdrop and covered with tiny bright hairs. Watching it, he feels a sudden inexplicable surge of tenderness and joy. Uh, unique, he thinks. There will never be another caterpillar just like this one. There will never be another such moment of time, another such conjunction. These things sneak up on him for no reason, these flashes of irrational happiness. It's probably a vitamin deficiency. The caterpillar pauses, feeling around in the air with its blunt head. Its huge opaque eyes look like the front end of Riot Gear helmet. Maybe it's smelling him, picking up on his chemical aura. We are not here to play, to dream, to drift, he says to it. We have hard work to do and loads to lift. Now what atrophying neural cistern in his brain did that come from? The life skills class in junior high? Probably not. Um, that little piece is from a hymn, which is a religious song called Be Strong. So probably not life skills class. We don't have life skills class anymore. Apparently we expect you to figure it out on YouTube. Um, but that would have been like home ec. You would have learned some cooking. You would have learned some sewing, you would have probably had an egg baby you had to carry around to prove that somehow not dropping an egg says you're ready to be a parent, you know, that sort of thing. But in his life skills class in junior high, the teacher had been a shambling neocon reject from the heady days of the legendary dot-com bubble back in prehistory. I'm not going to get too big into the dot-com bubble, but you could Google it if you felt like it. He had a stringy ponytail stuck to the back of his balding head and a faux leather jacket he'd worn a gold stud in his bumpy, porous old nose. And he'd pushed self-reliance and individualism and risk-taking in a hopeless tone, as if even he no longer believed in them. 
Once in a while, he'd come with some hoary maxim served up with a wry irony that did nothing to reduce the boredom quotient. Or else he'd say, I could have been a contender, and then glare meaningfully at the class as if there was some deeper than deep point that they were all supposed to get. They were. It's an illusion. The problem is you guys have no freaking culture, so you have no clue what it's an illusion to. Google it. Double entry on-screen bookkeeping, bank uh, banking by fingertip, using a microwave without nuking your egg, filling out housing applications for this or that module and job applications for this or that compound, family heredity, heredity research, negotiating your own marriage and divorce contracts, wise genetic matchmaking, the proper use of condoms to avoid sexually transmitted bioforms. Those had been the life skills. You would have gotten some of that in our uh, home ec class, but definitely not all of it. None of the kids had paid much attention. They either knew it already or didn't want to. They treated the class as a rest hour. We're not here to play, to dream, to drift. We're here to practice life skills. Whatever, says Snowman. Or instead of chess or a journal, he could focus on his living conditions. There's room for improvement in that department, a lot of room. More food sources for one thing. Why didn't he ever uh, bone up on roots and berries and pointed stick traps for skewering small game and how to eat snakes? Why had he wasted his time? I don't know, this is kind of a rhetorical question, obviously, but this idea like all of us sitting here in this room, right? How many of us have ever looked up what roots and berries we can eat? Okay, so that's a trick question because I actually did that because of uh, zombie apocalypse. I know, for example, my entire backyard is stinging nettle. I know that you can cook stinging nettle to make a really nice stew. Not saying I've ever done it, but I know you can. So maybe we just need to spend some more time thinking about the zombie apocalypse. I don't know. Oh, honey, don't beat yourself up, breathes a female voice regretfully in his ear. If only he could find a cave, a nice cave with a high ceiling and good ventilation and maybe some running water, he'd be better off. True, there was a stream with fresh water a quarter of a mile away. At one place, it widens into a pool. Initially, he'd gone there to cool off, but the Crakers might be splashing around in it, resting on the banks, and the kids would pester him to go swimming, and he didn't like being seen by them without his sheet. Compared to them, he's just too weird. They make him feel deformed. This is so strange. Imagine being the last, like, normal human left and caring about what people think about your body. Like, we are so damaged by media that he's the last freaking real dude on earth, and what he cares about is that the kids will look at him and how skinny he is. We have to get over this, you guys. If not people, there might well be animals, wolvogs, pigoons, bob kittens. That's a new one. Watering holes attract carnivores. They lie in wait. They slobber. They pounce. Not very cozy. The clouds are building, the sky darkening. He can't see much through the trees, but he senses the change in light. He slides off into a half-sleep and dreams of Oryx, floating on her back in a swimming pool, wearing an outfit that appears to be made of delicate white tissue. They spread out around her, expanding and contrasting like the valves of a jellyfish. The pool is painted a vibrant pink. She smiles up at him and moves her arms gently to keep afloat, and he knows they are both in great danger. And then there's a hollow booming sound, like the door of a great vault shutting. This part right here is foreshadowing. I'm trying to tell you that this is critically important. Please don't forget this later downpour. He wakes to thunder and a sudden wind. The afternoon storm is upon him, so that lets you know it happens every single day. So imagine every single day this gigantic storm. He scrambles to his feet, grabs his sheet. Those howlers can come on very fast, and metal bed frame in the thunderstorm is no place to be. Um, most people that get hit by lightning um, do it on the golf course because they're too stupid to go inside, and the like clubs are basically lightning rods. 
He built himself an island of car tires back in the woods. It's simply a matter of crouching on them, keeping their insulation between himself and the ground until the storm is over. So whatever school he went to, he has some basic knowledge that I think other people don't have. This idea that if you're in a lightning storm, you need rubber because rubber will absorb the lightning. So he built himself a pile of car tires. He talks about not knowing roots and berries, but he knows that. So he has some at least enough knowledge of survival to make it so that he doesn't die instantly. He reaches the pile of tires just as the storm breaks. Today it's only rain, the usual deluge, so heavy the impact turns the air to mist. Water sluices down onto him and the lightning sizzles, branches thrash around overhead, rivulets amble along the ground. Already it's cooling down, the scent of freshly washed leaves and wet earth fills the air. Once the rain has slowed to a drizzle and the rumbles of thunder have receded, he slogs back to his cement slab cache to collect the empty beer bottles. Then he makes his way to a jagged concrete overhang that was once part of a bridge. Beneath it, there's a triangular orange sign with the black silhouette of a man shoveling. Men at work, that used to mean. Strange to think of the endless labor, the digging, the hammering, the carving, the lifting, the drilling. Day by day, year by year, century by century, and now the endless crumbling that must be going on everywhere. Sand castles in the wind. I don't want to depress you too much, but I showed you guys uh, Life After People with the Road, and it is that idea. Humans spend all of our time building, and one day nature will spend all of her time taking our shit down. Runoff is pouring through a hole in the side of the concrete. He stands under it with his mouth open, gulping water full of grit and twigs and other things he doesn't want to think about. Um, then, dude, put your sheet over it. The water must have found a channel through derelict houses and pungent cellars and clotted up ditches and who knows what else. And then he rinses himself off, wrings out his sheet. He doesn't get himself very clean this way, but at least he can shed the surface layer of grime and scum. It'd be useful to have a bar of soap. He for keeps forgetting to pick one up during his pilfering excursions. Lastly, he fills up the beer bottles. He should get himself a better vessel, a thermos or a pail, something that would hold more. Also, the bottles are awkward. They're slippery and hard to position. He keeps imagining he can smell beer inside them, though it's only wishful thinking. Let's pretend this is beer. So even though the beer bottles are not the best uh, vessel or container, he keeps them for that, once again, sentimental purposes. He really wishes he was drunk. He shouldn't have brought that up. He shouldn't torture himself. He shouldn't dangle impossibilities in front of himself as if they were some caged, wired-up lab animal, trapped in performing futile and perverse experiments on his own brain. Get me out, he hears himself thinking, but he isn't locked up. He's not in prison. What could be more out than where he is? I didn't do it on purpose, he says, in the sniveling child's voice he reverts to in this mood. Things happened. I had no idea. It was out of my control. What could I have done? Just someone, anyone, listen to me, please. So this idea of apostrophe, he is talking to somebody that isn't there. In a sense, it's almost like he's talking to us, to God, to Oryx and Craig. I don't know, the dead people. But my question is, what did he do? Things happened. I had no idea. It was out of my control. Do you believe any of that? What could I have done? Just someone, anyone. So whatever he did was horrifying, but I'm kind of not believing him. Things happened. I had no idea. We always know. We just deny it. What a bad performance. Even he isn't convinced by it, but now he's weeping again. It's important, says the book in his head, to ignore minor irritants, to avoid pointless repinings, and to turn one's mental energies to immediate realities and to the tasks at hand. He must have read that somewhere. Surely his own mind would never have come up with pointless repinings, not all by itself. He wipes his face on the corner of the sheet. Pointless repinings, he says out loud. As often, he feels he has a listener, someone unseen, hidden behind the screen of leaves, watching him uh, slyly. Who do you think that is? Who is this silent listener? Is there a listener? Is it somebody from his past? Is it an animal? Is it the Krakers? Or is it Crake himself?